Blog Talk Radio. You are now listening to True Murder, the most shocking killers in true crime history and the authors that have written about them. Gacy, Bundy, Dahmer, The Night Stalker, BTK. Every week, another fascinating author talking about the most shocking and infamous killers in true crime history. True Murder, with your host, journalist and author, Dan Zupanski. Just days before Kurt Cobain's body was discovered on April 8, 1994, Courtney Love hired private investigator Tom Grant to locate him. In the mysterious death of Kurt Cobain, Tom Grant takes readers behind the scenes of the investigation. Here you can read a day-by-day account of Grant's investigation and learn about the evidence for murder regarding Kurt Cobain's death. There are many new details contained in the mysterious death of Kurt Cobain, including new transcripts of recorded telephone conversations with Courtney Love and others, as well as an updated list of persons of interest in the crime. In this book, you will get a clear picture of why Kurt Cobain was killed and who is responsible for his death. The book also contains a compelling account of Tom Grant's struggles to blow the whistle on the botched investigation into Cobain's death. Did Kurt Cobain really commit suicide, or was he murdered? You won't be able to honestly answer that question until you read and hear about the mysterious death of Kurt Cobain. Suicide or murder? You decide. With my special guest, Matthew Richer. Um, Welcome to the program, and thank you for agreeing this interview, Matthew Richer. Thank you for having me. Thank you very much. Uh, Very, very interesting story indeed, Uh, being a big music fan. um, This was an eye-opener, so let's... First off, let's uh, explain, uh, this is Grant, uh, Tom Grant's story, but tell us how you came to be able to write this book before I ask you any other questions um, regarding this story. Well, one of the, uh, Tom, I've known Tom for a number of years, and um, the other books have been written uh, about the case, and other articles have written about the case, but uh, typically, they contained um, a lot of errors and a few false theories. And Tom, uh, when Tom was um, speaking out about this case, he was actually still a full-time private investigator. He had been working on other cases, and he couldn't devote that much time uh, to to this story. But uh, you know, a, a few days back, Tom uh, retired, and he decided he was going to devote more time to this, and. He contacted me, and we, he and I discussed it, and we decided uh, to, to write a book together. And what I, uh, what we wanted, and certainly what I wanted, uh, was I thought it would be more effective for Tom to just tell the story uh, from his first-person perspective. You know, right. instead of hearing a story secondhand, which is how it sounded in every other treatment of the story, we wanted Tom to get uh, to tell the story from his perspective. We wanted to take readers behind the scenes and portray the story from the investigator's perspective. And you also, and you might say, we also uh, tell the story uh, or attempt to tell the story from the perspective of the main suspect, Courtney Love. Uh, Tom spent a lot of time with Courtney and uh, recorded, uh, as you uh, know, we can get into this, uh, most of the conversations he had with her uh, during 1994 and up until January 1995. I, I think Tom has um, over 30 hours of recorded conversations with her. So we know a lot about our thoughts and activities during 1994, and uh, we were able to um, uh, depict her her activities and her motives, I think, pretty compellingly and pretty accurately uh, in the book. Now you introduced basically the... Very interesting uh, and dogged nature, private investigator Tom Grant. So tell us about the where we are introduced to where Tom Grant is in, first in contact with Courtney Love. Tell us about that scene. Well, that's an interesting scene. It's um, uh, Tom was uh, representing. He had a client who was a prostitute. And uh, she was trying to get out of the 
the prostitution business, and she had to go and meet her madam. She was a high-priced call girl trying to get out of, uh, to break free of her madam. And Tom um, accompanied her to the Beverly Hills Peninsula Hotel, which is a very posh hotel. And um, he went with her that day to sort of provide security uh, so that this prostitute could break with her madam. And, um, and, um, uh, you know, after that, that appointment that morning, he went back to his office, and it was Easter Sunday. This is April 3rd, 1994, and he just wasn't expecting any calls at all. Uh, but uh, instead, the, um, the phone rang, and it was this woman answered the phone. She said, I'm Courtney Love, and uh, I need you to find out who's using my husband's stolen credit card. And he didn't know who Courtney Love was, and he didn't know who Kurt Cobain was, but he had a, an investigator, a young investigator there, who did know. And uh, so he said, okay, you know, I'll, I'll be over in a, in, a, in a couple of hours. And it turns out that Courtney Love was flipping through the yellow pages that day, trying to find, frantically trying to find a private investigator. And she saw Tom Grant's ad and just simply called him randomly. Now, what is so the... That's, that's how the whole case started. Yeah. Um so when they, when he does meet, what is his first impression? And so Courtney uh, loves appearance and his first um, his first impression of the meeting. <laughs> well, um, she was basically uh, when she answered the door, she was pretty much uh, you know there were a very nice hotel suite, but there were a bunch of groups in there. Uh, can I use four letter words in the show? A I'm couple, sure. Courtney Love. All right. <laughs> well, she answers the door, and there's a lot of um, there are a lot of people in the room, and a bunch of hangers on. And uh, he, um, she's wearing a very sheer nightgown. Tom said she was effectively naked, and uh, she answered the door, and she said, um, "Are you the private investigator?" He said, "Yes." Yeah. And she said, "If you leak any any of this to press, I'll sue the f out of you." And uh, so Tom said, oh, you know, that was quite an impression. And then she, uh, when she sat down to talk to him, he said, uh, okay, what's this about your husband's stolen credit card? And she sort of forgot what he was talking about. And he said, oh, no, that, that credit card wasn't stolen. I, I actually canceled it. And so that was, the, you know, right away she told Tom uh, a lie. The, the very basis for hiring her turned out to be a complete lie. And Tom had a feeling that it wasn't going to be the last. And so they had this very unusual, strange encounter. There were all these people in the room. They were clearly doing a lot of drugs. And um, got in a huge fight with her lead guitarist in the, in the room. And then at some point during this meeting, she told Tom that Kurt Cobain was suicidal. And, um, but then she said, you know, then she would switch back and say, oh, actually, you know, Kurt wants a divorce. And then she would say, oh, no, he's suicidal. And she kept switching and vacillating back and forth between these two possibilities. And Tom left the room and said, okay, I'll, you know, I'll try to find out where the credit card has uh, been used, and we'll try to locate your husband, who is you know, apparently missing. And as soon as he left the room and got on the elevator, he said to his, one of his investigators, you know, something's wrong here. We're going to record every conversation we have in this case. And that's what Tom did. He turned on his, his recorder, and he recorded everything. One thing that Courtney Love did not know is that a private investigator, a good private investigator, actually always has audiovisual equipment on him at all times. Right. Uh, they always, because they, they have to document everything. So Tom documented everything very well and recorded it. Um, she had no idea he was recording it, but it's a very well-documented case. She might not have known that he's obliged to go to the police if he were to uncover any evidence. She did not know he? that, and he did. He he was obliged, and he did go to the police, but they just didn't. They didn't seem interested. Yeah. Now, what we kind of skipped over is that the the other part of the first impression is that uh, in. Tom Grant's experience, uh, not only with the prostitute, but just on just his experience as a police officer, um, and and then now a private investigator. What did he notice in terms of the drug use in that room, in, in his estimation? 
Well, he noticed that he when he was a uh, when Tom was a private investigator. Uh, oh, and rather, when Tom was a police officer in Los Angeles, uh, he worked for the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department. He had arrested a lot of prostitutes and uh, a lot of other uh, drug users. And they often, um, they're, when people take uh, heroin, their pupils um, are pinned, they shrink, and also uh, they form a, uh, they have a white foam on their lips from amphetamines or you know, from heroin. And Courtney had those pin pupils, and she had that white phone on her lips, and so did everyone else in the room. And at one point, uh, some a woman walked by her wearing just a nightgown, and Courtney just looked at Tom and slapped her on the behind and said, oh, that's my dealer. So they really weren't hiding the fact that they were all in this room doing drugs. Now, Courtney told the press, of course, that they were in this room, uh, uh, that Courtney was alone in the hotel suite uh, undergoing a, a physician-assisted uh, drug detox, but that was completely false. It was a complete farce. She was, she was in there with her friends, and they were all doing drugs. Now, with the conversations she, he, uh, Tom Grant has with Courtney, because these are obviously extensive, and again, you say that she's, uh, you know, a very aggressive and also says things, um, he's very emotional, we'll say, to say the least. And we'll, you'll, you provide a lot of examples, but what did they? T- what did she t- mention about uh, divorce and assets and prenup? What was the information that she imparted to him, even if it were in pieces, about that? Well, she was saying that they. She told him right away that they had a prenuptial agreement, and uh, and she kept t- saying, you know, if, if we get a divorce, my ha- name is on all the houses and all the assets, and that doesn't mean anything if we get into court, but. Um, so she had a prenuptial agreement, and if they were to get a divorce, get half of his present estate. But, of course, if he were to commit suicide, she would get all of it. Now, um, another thing that was uh, another factor was her new album, Live the Wrist, was also coming out in the following week. Um, but that album release was going to be accompanied by some very damaging public revelations. One of them was Kurt Cobain was going to divorce her. The biggest, the biggest rock star in the world was divorcing Courtney, Courtney. And Nirvana, the hottest band in the world, was breaking up, and Courtney was a significant factor in the demise. In my suspicion, um, which I didn't really say too much in the book, but it is there, is that she, her fear was, uh, the, she never said this exactly to Tom, but my, her fear probably was that word was going to get out eventually that Kurt had actually written and composed the album. Um, she has always denied that fact. Uh, she says that Kurt, you know, was never in the studio or never had you know, contributed anything to the album, but uh, she later admitted that, in fact, he was in the studio. You can actually hear his voice uh, singing uh, in the background in several of the tracks. Uh, so um, remember, Courtney Love was nearly 30 years old in April 1994. That's very old for an aspiring musician, especially a woman. And uh, her al- her album, her big chance for fame, her big chance to break into rock stardom, just about to come out, and it was just about to fall apart because she and Kurt were breaking up. Uh, so the stakes were very high for her, and um, she was not going to let this opportunity slip from her hands. Let's go back to where Cobain and uh, Courtney uh, Love were in terms of their relationship. They had a child named Francis. So tell us how long they had been together. And uh, before we we talk about a couple other things revolving Courtney Love and Kurt Cobain. Well, they'd actually, before Kurt Cobain's death, they had actually known each other for uh, less than three years. Um, They've been a, uh, married for just over two years and been a couple for about two and a half. Uh, they um, first became a couple in, um, in uh, October of uh, 91 and uh, pregnant right away. And they had a, um, you know, a sort of a, a quick wedding and um, they were married just a little over two years. So they did not know each other even very long. Um, uh, so, you know, she married him right just as Nirvana was really taking off and um, or be, 
started dating him then. So they didn't really have a long relationship. But when they, um, when they got married, their management made Kurt Cobain get, uh, particularly Kurt's manager, John Silver, made Kurt get a prenuptial agreement. Now, Courtney has always told people that it was actually her idea to get the prenuptial agreement. That's not true. Uh, and on the, uh, I know the night before she got married, she met the music journalist Gina Arnold, and she told Gina Arnold, Gina Arnold said, Courtney, what do you, uh, congratulations, what's, what is Kirk going to get you for a wedding present? And Courtney looked at her and said, I'm going to get my husband's ATM card. So that was pretty much their relationship. As soon as they got married, immediately. Kirk Cobain was not a, a very strong personality. He was, um, you know, kind of a, he was a, you know, uh, he was 5'7", 120 pounds. He was, you know, very unassertive. Uh, he didn't like confrontation. He could be uh, pushed around very easily. Uh, he had a strong presence on stage, but not off stage. And Courtney has a very dominating personality, and she was able to push him around and take advantage of him quite easily. And almost as soon as they got married, she took over his finances completely. Uh, she was um, renting private jets. She was taking limousines everywhere. Courtney does not know how to drive. And um, really just running up his credit cards and buying jewelry, buying all kinds of things. And he was really powerless to do anything about it. Now, you chronicle in the book about to explain how this could possibly be in that Courtney Love uh, seems to be able to, as a musician, but even more importantly, she seems to be able to to be able to spot talent. So there's other yeah. characters, uh, famous and less famous, that are previous to her meeting up with Kurt Cobain that sort of explain, we'll say, her motivation and that eye for talent. So tell us a little bit about her background in that Seattle scene and the music scene itself. Well, she started out really in the Portland music scene, which is sort of uh, you know, uh, very complementary to the Seattle music scene. And when right. she was a teenager, according to Courtney, she saw Cheap Trick play in concert, and she managed to scam a backstage pass. And uh, she watched, you know, according to Courtney, she, when she saw the, uh, the power that the band had over the audience, she... Um, she decided that this was what she wanted to be. This was her ultimate goal in life, to become a rock star. And she started out by becoming a, a rock and roll groupie. She, went, uh, she inherited some money from her grandmother, and she went over to Britain, to Liverpool, uh, and to New York City, and she was traveled a lot as a professional groupie. And she began, uh, according to Courtney, she began performing you know, sex acts on different members of the band, even as a you know, young teenager, uh, in order to get the attention of the lead singer. And uh, terrible as it was, uh, Courtney did begin to meet people and get to know people uh, in the music business, and that's how she did it. She became a professional groupie. She was a very assertive, very outspoken groupie, but that's what she did, and that was her version of climbing the ladder. So by the time... Um, you know, she got into her 20s. Uh, she she targeted first a musician named Roz Resback in Portland, uh, who was the head of a band called Theater of Sheep. But, you know, his career didn't take off. And then so she moved on to a man named James Moreland, who had a band in Los Angeles, and she married him briefly. The band didn't take off either. And then she targeted uh, Billy Corgan, which was a very successful, you know, before he became famous. And that was... Right. Uh, Pretty smart move, pretty shrewd of her to target a man that talented. And she was with Billy Corgan for quite a while until she saw Kurt Cobain perform live. And when she saw Kurt Cobain and Nirvana perform live, she actually borrowed money from um, her attorney, Rosemary Carroll, and she took a flight to Chicago and she um, uh, attended a Nirvana show and then she betted Kurt Cobain after the show. And she was pregnant within a couple of weeks. That's pretty much how, how, how she landed him. Yeah, interesting. And and she's the... A, sorry, go ahead. No, I'm just saying, she's a very strong-willed person. I don't know if I've ever encountered anyone um, with a will as strong as Courtney Love. And you can say what you want about her, but 
it's 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 one of her most powerful qualities. Now you're talking about what you know about this case, but it's a little bit different about Tom Grant. When Tom Grant got involved in this case, he didn't know anything about Nirvana or who Nothing. Kurt Cobain Nothing. or anybody was, did he? Right. No, and that's. I think I make that clear in the book when uh, when when we the book begins. Tom doesn't know anything about um, either of them. Tom knew criminals though, and uh, he didn't know. He knew that Courtney was up to something, and he knew that she was up to something bad. But he um, he took the position of okay, well, if if this man Kurt Cobain really is, he might be suicidal. Maybe he's not suicidal. But I'm not going to take any chances. So Tom said he was, you know, I'm going to record everything. I'm going to document everything because I know something is going on here. But I'm going to go to Seattle to search for Kurt Cobain because I'm a, a man's life is at stake. And so that's what he did. But he was he, when Tom was an investigator, he only operates in the mode of an investigator. And that's I think what I try to show in the book. So he, we, he the evidence as it appears, as Tom encounters it, uh, right up until um, Kurt Cobain dies. Now, after, uh, after, after Kurt Cobain's death, Tom goes back to Los Angeles, where he uh, gets a phone call from Kurt Cobain and Courtney Love's attorney, Rosemary Carroll. And it was Rosemary Carroll who first told him that Kurt Cobain was not suicidal and that she believed that Kurt Cobain did not commit suicide. So when Tom got that confirmation from someone uh, in their inner circle, someone who wasn't someone who was bright and who wasn't a, um, a musician, uh, someone she was a very shrewd woman, Rosemary Carroll. And uh, when Tom got that com- confirmation, he realized he started suspecting, okay, this maybe this was a murder after all, and not a suicide. With that information too, he being an investi- private investigator and a police officer, he when he had that first encounter, there was people like, uh, and you can correct me, when you can introduce the characters that are very important to this story that were the syncophants and the people with a, a motivation to, to need to hang around and musicians as well. And you can explain also the bizarre uh, couple guys that are nannies, you know, teenage yeah, nannies. Yeah, so, yeah. Um, so let's hear about Eric Erlander and uh, Michael Cali. So introduce three or four of these characters that were there at the time Tom Grant briefly met them. And then as a private investigator, he says, I need to talk to this person and this person. So introduce some of those characters, please. Well, um, we do give a, a, a biographical section of, of Courtney in the book. And it's called the head and heart of Courtney. It's a section of the book. I think the second section of the book called the head of heart of Courtney Love, and we describe her as a sociopath. That's what we believe she is. And um, um, in, this begins all the way. We even uh, cite her, her. Courtney Love has a mother, Linda Carroll, who's a therapist, and um, we cite her uh, testimony in uh, Linda Carroll's own memoir about some of the things Courtney did when she was a child. Courtney was just born a, a, a profoundly disturbed person. Uh, she had, you know, just serious mental problems, um, and she had serious problems with violence. She was in a, a reform school as a teenager. Uh, she often had to be put in restraints. She turned tricks. She stripped. Um, n- none of what she had to do, but she, that was just, uh, she just had a darkness about her when she was born, and the mother seemed powerless to do anything about it. Now, as a sociopath, um, one quality that sociopaths have is they excel at manipulating other people to do pretty much whatever they want to do. And um, Courtney seems to attract people, men and women, um, and I would say men especially, who are sort of weak-willed men that she can pretty much manipulate into doing whatever she wants. Now, her guitarist, Eric Erlinson, he was the guitarist in the band, he took out an ad for a band, uh, took out an ad in a classified newspaper in Los Angeles asking uh, if anyone wanted to put together a band. And Courtney responded, and um, but when she responded to the 
she responded the rest is history, but it's a history she really rewrote to fit uh, her own agenda. Courtney quickly made the band her own, and Eric Erlinson was sort of her, to this day, sort of her um, her, her lead gopher, so to speak. And um, he has always done all kinds of unsavory tasks for her. Um, you know, he beats people up for her, women especially. He um, he he. She she described it as if I ever blew my nose, she told the interviewer. Eric Erlinson would go and run and grab the Kleenex. And so uh, that's one person. We describe him as, as a person of interest in the book. And then there's uh, Callie DeWitt. Callie DeWitt was a teenager who um, dropped out of high school and began working as, um, in, as a roadie for Hull uh, when he was about 16 years old. He actually became he, uh, began having a sexual relation, relationship with Courtney at that time. And um, he pretty much did whatever Courtney wanted to do. Courtney wanted to go get drugs. He would go get drugs. Courtney wanted to do this. Courtney wanted to do that. He would simply go and do it. She seemed to attract these people um, uh, into her life. And now, um, or these people seemed to be attracted to her. Now, after she married Kirk Cobain, she um, hired uh, Cal- Michael Kelly to it. They call him Kelly because he's from Calabasas, California. She hired Callie to be her nanny, even though the uh, Callie was a teenager and he was a serious heroin addict at the time. Uh, that's what she did, because she wanted someone in the in the home uh, that she could control completely and who would do whatever she wanted to do. Now, what Callie got for that was he got heroin. She used Kurt's money to maintain his habit, and. She also did that with another, there's another fellow named Rene Navarrete that we mentioned in the book. He was also a heroin addict, and he was also one of the male full-time nannies that Courtney employed. And uh, he was best friends with Callie DeWitt, and Courtney also paid for his heroin. So that was with Kurt's money. So that was two, guy, two male nannies who were both addicted to heroin, and they needed Kurt Cobain's money uh, in, order to, um, in order to maintain their fix maintain their habit. Now, if Kurt and Courtney divorce, those guys, Courtney's not going to have uh, so much money anymore. And those guys, where are they going to get their heroin? So that was, uh, that's, we think, um, one, of the, um, one of the motives, if you will, in this story. One of the possible motives is simply the fact that um, heroin addicts need to maintain their, their, their heroin connection. And Courtney held up that, that power. That was a power Courtney had that she held over. Well, you know, Courtney has to be the ringleader here, regardless if we can say, you know, this person has a motivation because they're a heroin addict. I mean, sure, they have a motivation, but there are other people that have a motivation as well, and stronger motivation. Courtney Love is a heroin addict, but also what I found was fascinating is Again, you're not saying an outright conspiracy or people knew what was going to happen, but the very interesting meeting that you chronicle of the music execs, uh, and you talk about Courtney Love's, uh, again, super hypocritical uh, attempts at intervention and the ones involving the music execs. And really what you outline is that it seems more about the 900 or tell us about how much money was involved with the Lollapalooza and what at Kurt least, didn't want to do at least a 900 he was guaranteed at least nine and a half million dollars to do a tour in the summer of 1994 the Lollapalooza tour now uh he was he was turning that money down he simply didn't want to be in Nirvana anymore now there was an inter there was a, an intervention shortly before Kurt Cobain's death and at that intervention was Courtney Love and uh, a few of their, a few people in their social circle and um, members of the music and uh, some music executives that were there. And it was at Kurt's house in Seattle. Now, at that meeting, no one, after Kurt's death, everyone was saying he was desperately suicidal. But before Kurt's death, no one was saying that he was suicidal. Now, at this meeting, the 
the um, way Courtney has portrayed this meeting in the press is that she wanted Kurt to go into rehab to kick drugs, uh, but uh, also that this was um, this intervention was for the purpose of saving Kurt Cobain's life. But that is not true. No one ever mentioned suicide at this meeting. Kurt was going to hurt himself or Kurt was going to commit suicide. That wasn't true. They wanted him to go to rehab so he could clean himself up so that he could meet uh, so he could meet the obligation of that contract and go on tour. Everyone at that meeting, everyone at that in- intervention had a financial incentive in Kurt Cobain performing that summer. But he didn't want to perform. So he just didn't want to be in Nirvana anymore. His plan was to leave Nirvana and just be a studio musician pretty much on his own and do some of his own projects. He didn't want to tour anymore. He didn't really want the celebrity side of music anymore. And But there's no money in that for everyone else. They had a financial incentive. And so at that intervention, it was more like, Kurt, clean up your act and go on the tour and go into um, – go into rehab. Now, just after that intervention, Kurt went out and bought a shotgun. And the shotgun that he purchased was uh, a light load shotgun. Um, It was the kind of shotgun um, that you would use for home defense. It can, you know, you can shoot the burglar, but the shotgun shell wouldn't penetrate the walls of a home. So you wouldn't accidentally kill someone in the next room. Something, it it was that kind of weapon. If they right. would be a strange weapon to purchase for the purpose of committing suicide. So what Kurt did was he, so he buys this shotgun, and he leaves it at his house, and then he flies down to Los Angeles to attend drug rehab. Now, what Courtney Love did was she, once he, back at the hotel room at the Peninsula Hotel, Courtney Love, um, a few days later, after she had hired, the day after she had hired Tom Grant, she had filed a missing persons report with the Seattle Police Department. But when she filed this report, she, and first of all, she filed it under the name of Kurt Cobain's mother, whose name is Wendy O'Connor. Kurt had a, uh, didn't have much of a relationship with his mother. His mother was sort of semi-estranged. But Courtney filed this missing report, her mother-in-law's name, and she did that because she wanted to word the report. And the report said Kurt ran away from a California drug facility, purchased a shotgun, and maybe suicidal. Now, we, now I describe this in the book as framing the narrative. Courtney wanted to frame the narrative in her favor, and that's why she worded this report this way. Now, of course, Kurt Cobain did not run away from a California drug facility. In fact, he, was in a vol- he checked into a voluntary facility. He was free to leave any time he wanted to. And when he left on Friday, April 1st, he simply walked out the front door and caught a cab to the airport. Now, but he purchased a shotgun before he went to drug rehab. Uh, And so, uh, but that's not what the police thought. When they saw this police report, when they saw this missing person report, a, a missing person report that was quickly released to the media, they simply assumed it was true and never questioned it. Kurt Cobain ran away from a drug facility, purchased a shotgun, and maybe suicidal. After all, his own mother said so. So, why would you uh, why would you question it? So, when the when Kurt Cobain um, was his body was found on April eighth, um, the police pretty much uh, closed the case based on that initial report. They closed the case that morning. They simply arrived at the scene and simply signed it off as a suicide. And if you look at the police reports, which we quote in the book which you can find some of them online, um, you can see that they simply showed up, they said, um, and they closed it that morning, and they signed the death, and the medical examiner performed the autopsy that night and signed the death certificate the following day as a suicide, um, a Saturday. He signed, the medical examiner signed the, uh, the death certificate as a suicide. Then, now, the toxicology results weren't available for three or four weeks, but they still signed it off as a suicide. And within six days, of the body, six days after the body was discovered, the body was cremated. And once the body is cremated, of course, the case is closed. The same day the body is cremated, however, a report comes out in the Seattle Post Intelligence that the Seattle Police later admitted uh, is, was true. 
that uh, the drug test done on Kurt Cobain's um, uh, blood uh, revealed that he had um, 1.52 milligrams of heroin uh, per liter uh, in his system. Now, that is three times the lethal dose of heroin. So the question is, um, how could Kurt Cobain have picked up a shotgun, inserted it into his mouth, and pulled the trigger uh, after injecting a three times a lethal dose of heroin. It's simply impossible. And then we, and we spend a, a good uh, deal of uh, describing this in the book, the nature of, of heroin um, overdose and the nature of heroin use, actually. Um, now, most people, when, they, when, you, when an addict injects heroin and injects too much heroin into the system, they're found with the needle still in the arm. It and it uh, enters the bloodstream in the brain very quickly and it stops breathing very quickly. And that's why addicts are found with the needle still in the arm. When you overdose, it's, it's almost instant. So Kurt Cobain would have lost unconsciousness within seconds. Uh, so it would have been impossible for him to pick up that shotgun and insert it into his mouth. In fact, uh, we know that he, um, the safety tips on the syringes, he was injected twice, once in each arm, and the safety tips on the syringes were actually reapplied uh, after, after yeah. the injection. They were, the syringes were placed back into the drug kit. The drug kit was placed far from the body, and his sleeves were actually rolled down. And there was very little, um, his face was actually perfectly intact, uh, almost perfectly intact. So um, it's virtually impossible for him to have picked up um, to pick up that shotgun after taking a triple deadly dose of heroin. He would have been unconscious within seconds after that, after that injection. And also, there's something about the experience of heroin. I mean, heroin, within a few seconds of taking heroin, within about 10 seconds, the heroin user experiences what is called the rush, which is an intense euphoric experience that lasts for several minutes. If you are addicted to heroin, heroin is a euphoric drug. And so if you are addicted to heroin, you are addicted to this rush, this euphoric experience. So how many deny themselves this rush, this euphoric experience, just before it's about to take place? It's, it's inconceivable. And it's virtually never happened before. So you, you couldn't take a euphoric drug and then stick a gun into your mouth and pull the trigger. Why not wait? Why not wait? How could you deny this uh, experience before it takes place? Addicts are really not capable of that. We never found it. We couldn't find a single example of uh, anyone being able to function with this much heroin in the system at all. And we couldn't find a single example of anyone uh, committing suicide after injecting heroin. Not one. Right. Now you talk about the the other thing that we just skipped over as well is that um, you do explain that Kurt Cobain is not, not, this is not the first time, even though it wouldn't seem to fit with his character, that he would ever have a gun. But he did enjoy going out and shooting at targets. He really wasn't a hunter or anything. And he did have guns, and his guns were taken away before when Courtney Love had called about a fake, and you write about this in the book, about a fake uh, suicide attempt. Meanwhile, he's in the backyard with his hands in his pocket, and he seemed embarrassed when right. cops came. So it explains right. why he would have a gun. So it doesn't lend any credence that suddenly he got the gun for any specific reason other than he kind of liked guns and he didn't have any more anymore. And so he bought this not really, again, not very effective for a suicide. Um, what was the other, as you, as you chronicle in the book, what were the other kind of very weak things that were at the crime scene that the, the police later cited as evidence of that he must have committed suicide? Well, first of all, there's the suicide note itself. The suicide note, if you read the note, and you can find it online, this, the only reason the suicide note is even uh, public, of course, is because Tom, and this is described in the book, Tom uh, kind of hoodwinked Courtney into allowing him to make a photocopy of the note in her house. And uh, it was Tom who made that note public, not Courtney. But if you look at the note, um, the note actually reads uh, like a letter to his fans about why he was breaking up Nirvana. 
it, um, it doesn't mention his wife and child really at all, except in the third person. Uh, it's all about music. It's written in red pen on the back of an IHOP menu. And uh, probably as he was sitting in a booth getting something to eat. And um, the only thing about the, uh, the note that sounds suicidal are the final four lines. And the final four lines uh, say, please keep going, Courtney, for Francis, for her life, which would be so much happier without me. He signs the note, Kurt Cobain, his full name. That's something most people would do. Now, if you, read the, if you look at the final four nine, lines, you'll see that the, it's, and it's pretty obvious that they're written in a different hand. Uh, the writing is even, uh, the letters are even uh, thinner than in the body of the note. And the handwriting is clearly not the same hand. And we've, you know, other, um, other, uh, some handwriting analysts have looked at it and concluded that the, that the letter is not written, uh, that the postscript and the main body of the letter were written by two different people. Now, uh, getting back to the, and, and also getting back to your question, one thing that the detectives at the crime scene did not realize was that um, Kirk Cobain's shotgun, when the shotgun was found, it was loaded to full capacity. Um, which would be unusual for someone to commit suicide. You only need one shotgun shell to commit suicide, but it was fully loaded. But the shotgun right. shell was lying inverted across his chest. The exit chamber on the shotgun shell was facing Kirk Cobain's right. However, the spent shotgun shell, Kirk Cobain's left, it should have ejected to the right the way it was found, but it was found to his left. Um, now, this was something, this is a major red flag, but the detectives... Uh, you know, overlooked it, and I think the reason they overlooked it is because they uh, arrived at the crime scene uh, under the assumption that it was a suicide. And uh, just when you arrive at the crime scene under that assumption, you know, you simply um, you, you're you're blind to evidence like that. Um, you know, police departments don't really have to prove suicide. You have to prove murder. You have to prove murder, murder in court, and you have to prove murder to um, you know, to the public, uh, to a district attorney, to a victim's family. But suicide, you don't really have to prove it. Uh, if a police officer, uh, police investigators uh, rule a case of suicide, they can simply scribble suicide on the cause of death and move on. Uh, that's the funny thing about it. So um, uh, they simply were blind to a lot of this evidence at the scene. And um, they announced... Uh, spokesman actually stood outside the uh, crime scene a few hours after Kirk Cobain's body was discovered and uh, announced that it was a suicide and that there was a suicide note found at the scene. So, um, you know, it's just, um, it's just, it's just the mind boggling. But you write that that's not normal. I mean, Tom was a, a cop in LA, so it's either, I don't know if it's a state thing or a city thing or, you know, a county it, thing, but Certainly, that's not. The, they had sort of a cavalier, according to Tom, attitude towards suicide. In that, well, if it was just a beat cop, and he was there, and he determined it was suicide. That's fine. So they didn't approach it like other jurisdictions would even approach it. That's that correct. Crimes. And in, in, in many jurisdictions, uh, the um, any time a body is, is found, an any time there's an unintended death, a homicide investigator will investigate determined that no foul play was involved. But that's not the way they do it in Seattle, even to this day, actually. In Seattle, they allow a patrol officer, some of whom we to be just out of the academy, to, to, uh, to arrive at that scene and determine whether or not foul play was involved. So a, a patrol officer, he might be you know, 20, 21 years old, say, he will arrive at the crime scene and say, gee, I think there might be foul play, or no, it looks like, a, it looks like an accidental death, or it looks like a suicide to me. That's very common in a lot of jurisdictions, that they don't have uh, homicide investigators respond to every unattended death. At the same time, it's not considered, it's common, but it's not considered proper. But, uh, but that's the way it's done in Seattle to this day. It's still in the Seattle Police Manual. Also talked about, uh, I, I believe, the medical examiner and his lack of um, actually being an accredited medical examiner. And also you show the background, Tom, and you show the background of who this person was and, again, a possible motivation 
in terms of our conflict. So tell us about the relationship with this ME and Courtney Love and the credentials that you talk about. Yeah, well, you know, this, this is another example of the truth being strange in fiction. The medical examiner who performed the autopsy uh, and who was actually uh, arrived at the crime scene was not a board-certified medical examiner. He was only 30 years old. His name was Nicholas Hartzorn. He was um, at the King County Medical Examiner's Office doing a one-year apprenticeship in, uh, in forensic science. And he performed the autopsy on Kurt Cobain, and he, was, he actually uh, went to the crime scene and, and um, finger, fingerprinted the body. And <clears throat> Nicholas Hartzorn was actually uh, good friends with Courtney uh, Courtney Love. Seattle is a very small town. He was a big fan of the uh, Seattle music scene, and he um, he was um, involved in the promotion of, of rock concerts and grunge rock concerts a lot. And he should have uh, that day. I don't believe that you know Nicholas Hotsong was in a sense in on it or anything like that. There's no real evidence of that. But he was a young guy. He showed up at the crime scene. In the, the homicide detectives had already uh, determined that this was a suicide. And he was very inexperienced, probably a little starstruck. He did not really know Kurt Cobain, but he did know Courtney Love. And he showed up that day, and he performed the autopsy that night and wrote suicide on the cause of death the next day. But, yeah, he's 30 years old and uh, not yet board-certified medical examiner. Really a disgrace that this person was allowed to, to, to do that. Uh, so a few days later, when the drug test results came in and they showed that uh, Kurt Cobain had, uh, you know, three times the lethal dose of heroin in his system, uh, this uh, this fellow probably didn't even understand the significance of the evidence. He was that inexperienced. Yeah, it's interesting, too, that uh, I, I read all um, what uh, the esteemed medical examiner, Cyril uh, Wecht, wrote about, Cyril Wecht wrote about in terms of how shocked he was at uh, the medical examiner's behavior, I guess, and conclusions and uh, procedures. So uh, very interesting. He's been a guest on the program a couple times. So oh, yeah. um, when he weighs in like that and such a, again, a very strong statement from him is, um, you know, evidence that there's something, there was something amiss. Um, there was one other thing, too, that there was – the talk of that, well, he could have, he, he killed himself because um, he was locked, the doors were locked. So tell us about, the, and the doors were locked and the, oh yes, the and the chair that was uh, jammed up against the handle, door handle. Right, well, we were, um, the, um, the story that the police uh, put out was that, uh, and that Courtney put out, was that <clears throat> uh, Kirk Cobain uh, was, um, locked inside the, had locked himself inside the greenhouse and and pressed a stool against the doors so that no one could enter and then committed suicide but um when tom grant went into the uh greenhouse and he took photographs of the of the, of, uh, of the crime scene um he found out that it was just a, a simple push and twist lock on the doors and that anyone could open it up uh you know so it, it was like a basically a bathroom door lock and he found the stool, and the stool was a really tiny little stool. And Tom took pictures of the stool, and um, there was no way you put it up against any door and, and block anything. Now, um, there is no mention of this stool in the initial police reports, but uh, there is an extra page added on at the end of the police reports uh, where the responding officer claims that there was a stool um, that is... Um, that was pressed up against the uh, greenhouse doors that was that prevented access. Now that was added on after the fact, we believe, because the police department uh, realized that the uh, that the reports did not reflect the story that was out there in the press, um, meaning that Kurt Cobain must have been alone inside the room when he died. Uh, now the we spoke to and I spoke to him personally the fireman who forced entry into the greenhouse that day, his name is Lieutenant John Fisk, and he's still on the uh, fire department. And he told us you know, unequivocally that there was no stool against that door. They were able to push those doors open very easily. 
So the Seattle Police Department did that. They added that little detail onto the reports uh, because that's what often happens with with the police department. Uh, Tom said, you know, when, when he was in the L.A. County Sheriff's Department, that happened all the time. That the supervisor would come up to you and say, oh, you know, you've got to you've got to add something in here. You know, this this isn't good enough. You have to put in a detail about this or that. And commanders do this all the time to to police officers uh, when they go over their reports to them. Someone probably went up to this uh, to this uh, the res- first responding officer, namely uh, an officer named Vaughn Lewandowski, and told him you have to add a little item about the stool because uh, you know we have to cover ourselves here. And it's very obvious when you read the reports that says he has to prove that in there. So they were doing damage control the Seattle Police Department very early after um, the body was discovered. Uh, they realized I think probably within a week of the uh, of of the body being discovered that they had botched the investigation and they started doing damage control and they've been doing it ever since. And they also knew that they had Tom Grant on on the scene as well, hired by Courtney Love, and he was acting like a real investigator where other people were taking the word of Courtney Love or other or taking the narrative, like you say, the narrative with in factual or non factual information loaded in there and then taking and building other reasons for things from there. So um inherently wrong approach. And but they knew that Tom Grant was asking some probing questions. Now at the same time part of this incredible again you say sociopathic character is Courtney Love is that she is making sure that she is going to capitalize on this, no matter what, you, again, you talk about this album coming out on April 12th of that year. Uh, so how does she manipulate some of the biggest journalists in the music business? And what does she uh, tell them in that uh, goal of manipulation? Well, Courtney spends, um, Courtney is a very charming person. I've met Courtney Love and, uh, uh, but not in a long time, and uh, she is a very she has a real she, she has a real charm about her, and everyone who meets her finds her very charming. And um, um, she spends about eight to twelve hours a day, as I understand it, on the telephone, and she calls journalists directly. She is a media she is a um, you know a master of media manipulation. And I describe this in the book. You ha- you have to be impressed about how very good how skilled she is at manipulating the press. Now, the press that she manipulates is pretty much the rock and roll entertainment press. And as I say, you know, right away in the introduction, a lot of rock and roll journalists, these are not the best writers and these are not the smartest guys, a lot of them. So they're very, it's very easy to, uh, to manipulate them. And she does this by charming them, by calling them constantly on the phone and um, she makes, she has a knack for making people feel like they're very important, like they're her closest friends, uh, and it really works for her. Now, when Kurt Cobain's body was discovered, she was on the phone that very day with calling music journalists. Uh, she called, uh, she had uh, the music journalist Ever True fly out from Cincinnati to Seattle that day. Uh, she gave uh, several uh, journalists uh, Tom Grant's cell phone number uh, the day Kirk Cobain's body was discovered. Tom's cell phone number was ring- cell phone was ringing off the hook for days with journalists who gotten who had gotten his number uh, from Courtney Love. Um, so um, you know she was on the phone constantly right after Kirk Cobain died, plugging her album. Um, she was on the phone with Kurt Loader on MTV. Uh, the day after Kurt Cobain died. And she had an interesting conversation with Loader, and uh, Kurt, Kurt Loader described it on air. Now, the thing about, um, the thing about Courtney is, is, you know, suicide is a very, uh, a suicide is a very difficult, a, a genuine suicide is a very difficult experience. If your spouse commits suicide, you know, those people go through a living hell. But Courtney was on the phone constantly uh, after his death talking to everyone, and she called, um, you know, she wasn't expressing any sadness at all to Tom Grant or to others after Kurt Cobain's death, uh, unless, of course, the cameras were rolling. 
But she called Kurt Loder the day after uh, Kurt Cobain died and told him, you know, uh, you know, several, um, fed him several false facts that got out there. One of them, she, she described the suicide note, and uh, she used this quote from the note. She, she quoted the note as saying, um, it's no fun for me anymore. I can't live this life. Well, that line doesn't appear anywhere in the suicide in the in the alleged suicide note. And she also told Kurt Loder that uh, the damage to Kurt Cobain was head was so severe that he had to be identified with fingerprints. Well, that's false. His the damage to his face was minimal. And the reason he had to be identified with fingerprints is that because it's standard procedure to fingerprint the deceased regardless of the condition of the body. Uh, and she also told him that Kurt Cobain wrote a suicide that was note that was addressed to her. That is also not true. That suicide note was not addressed to her. So she does this the day after the um, body is discovered, but Loder gets on air and describes the conversation in detail. And those facts were repeated in the media um, all over the world. Now you have to realize that in 1994, the media moved much more. It's easy to bash the mainstream media, but in 1994, the media much moved very slowly. Uh, there wasn't really any online news in 1994, not much of it. Uh, online, you know, stories didn't break online in 1994. You had to wait for the radio, the evening news, or, or the morning paper. Uh, and so it was, in a way, much, more, much easier for her to manipulate the press back then. And the mainstream media was a little bit out of their element reporting on Kirk Cobain's death because it was a different world to them. It was a shadowy world of, you know, heroin and grunge. It was something they didn't understand. And, and they often deferred to the music media, the rock and roll press, to, to describe the crime of Kirk Cobain's death. Uh, they simply deferred to them. And the music media, they were out of their element. They didn't understand anything about stage suicides or any possibility uh, uh, of such a thing. If the Seattle police say it was a suicide, they're going to believe it's a suicide. And they're not going to question it. It wasn't like today with an online media. Stories can be updated. Uh, there's, a, there's a lot more competition. There's a lot more alternative points of view. Uh, stories can be updated online and uh, constantly. And I don't think she could have gotten away with it today. But, uh, but in 1984, she was able to manipulate the press you know, very skillfully and very shrewdly. We describe that in the book, how skilled she is at doing that. And, um, you know, it's, it's a, it was a terrible thing, but in a way, it, at the same time, it's highly impressive. Let's talk about Tom Grant, his relationship with Courtney Love, and the point where he says to her, listen, because there are points where he says, you, you want me to continue keep looking? You want me to keep investigating? I mean, he, he's working for her, but at the same time, he has his own code of ethics in terms of he's not going to do anything illegal for her, and his loyalty is just to the truth. That's all. So when does he have this? Tell us about how you describe the, the conversation he has with Courtney, and he's kind of surprised at her reaction and what goes on after he tells her what his, his purpose is and what he's going to do. Tell us about that. Well, this is one of the points in the book that I find um, you know, it, a very interesting, very revealing, and and also amusing. Now, uh, Tom is um, Tom is a Tom is a tough guy, and Tom became suspicious of um, Tom started becoming more and more suspicious, and uh, he wrote Courtney a letter about a month after Kurt Cobain's death, and he said, uh, you know, I'm very suspicious. I'm highly suspicious of your husband's death. Uh, consider your bill paid in full, and uh, I'm going to keep re investigating this death on my own. He sends her that letter, the letter effectively saying, you know, I believe your husband was murdered. Now, uh, you would expect Courtney Love has a legendary volcanic temper. You expect yeah. her to get very angry over something like that. He also sure. helped put an article in the Seattle Times that caused uh, that that um, that shed some light on uh, Kurt Cobain's final days and, and questioned the police investigation. And uh, Courtney knew that the report of the Seattle Times, Steph Wilson, got a lot of information from, from Tom. 
but she didn't um, ask him about it. So when Tom sends her this letter, this uh, this letter that must have scared the hell out of her, what she did instead was she didn't call him angrily. She Instead, she called him, and I transcribed this conversation in the book, and she tried to charm him, and she talked to him like they were best friends. Now, this is one of Coney's routines. She puts on a, a charm routine for people uh, that she uh, – when she wants something from them, she tries to charm them. And she starts charming him. She's talking to him like they were buddies. And then she hires him to do more work. I can't imagine someone investigating, effectively investigating murder and hiring them to do more work. Uh, so let me put it this way. It's very unusual for a private investigator to investigate his client for murder and to conti- openly investigate his client for murder and continue to work for that client on other matters. I've simply never heard it. It's just a very no. bizarre situation. I've never heard of anything like that in my life. So it's, <laughs> you know, it's kind of funny. And then when one of the things that uh, Courtney had Tom do was, of course, to surveil uh, her new boyfriend. She had moved on very quickly to uh, Trent Reznor, the lead singer of Nine Inch Nails, and Courtney was obsessed with the fact that uh, Trent might be cheating on her. So Tom um, um, began to surveil uh, Trent Reznor as he went on tour. And uh, Courtney would call him and tell him, you know, where Trent was going to be staying and who Trent was hanging out with. And, uh, and, and that's, what, uh, that's what Tom, a lot of what Tom was doing for her during the summer of 1994. Now, um, that, of course... Uh, was probably not smart of Courtney because, you know, it only made Tom more suspicious because if you're really a grieving widow and a grieving suicide survivor, what are you doing running off with a you know, new rock star within months of your husband's death? Not how you know, genuinely grieving uh, widows would behave. But, uh, yeah, very strange. Um, very strange. But it, it went on, as you can hear this now, you can see this in the recordings that I transcribed, and, and if you get the chance to hear them. As a private investigator, you're not in a position to really interrogate clients because, uh, in theory, the client is free to hire, fire you whenever they want. So you really can't ask uh, too many aggressive questions. Uh, that's just not what investigators uh, can do. But Tom started getting more aggressive with Courtney, and you can hear that in their conversations. And Courtney become uh, much more fearful, and she started trying to get Tom to sign this confidentiality agreement, and Tom refused to sign it. And um, then, after a while, she started hiring other attorneys and other private investigators and trying to convince Tom to work with them. And what she was really trying to do was trying was figure out what Tom had learned and what Tom was up to. So she was really sweating uh, as summer turned into fall in 1994. And um, Tom was asking Courtney to submit to a polygraph. He wanted Callie DeWitt to submit to a polygraph because Callie DeWitt was actually at the house when Kurt Cobain died. We know that. And he wanted a copy of the autopsy report. In the state of Washington, autopsy reports are considered private medical records. In, every, in most jurisdictions, they're open to the public, but not in the state of Washington. So he wanted the autopsy report. Now, Courtney promised many times that she would deliver on all of these things, but, uh, but she never did and hasn't to this day. But she could gladly... And one of the, um, one of the, um, the turning point for Tom was when Courtney gave an interview to uh, David Frick of Rolling Stone. And in that interview, she describes a second suicide note, uh, alleged suicide note. Well, actually, I'm sorry. This is a third suicide note. There's a third suicide note. Because an alleged uh, suicide note in Rome. It, uh, Kurt allegedly wrote in Rome, Italy, the, the month before he died. But she also said that Kurt left her a second suicide note at his home uh, um, when he died. Now, Courtney had never told anyone about this other suicide note. She'd never told Tom. She'd never told the police. Uh, 
no one had ever seen it before. And when Tom found out about this note, you can hear this uh, in the recording, she claimed that she, the note had been left underneath her pillows. But as we describe in the book, Tom actually um, inspected her bed very thoroughly and picked up the mattress and pulled it over and uh, was looking for drugs. And there was no note underneath Courtney's pillows. And the reason she made up this um, other note is because uh, she didn't like the way the interviewer from Rolling Stone was asking questions about the, the veracity, the legitimacy of the suicide note. So she switched the subject and decided to start talking about this other note that no one else had seen. So when Tom found out that she had lied about this, he realized then that was a breaking point. And I described this in the book. He realized that he has to come out and speak publicly. And that was one of the parts of the book that's never been really discussed uh, before, that Tom's never discussed, is his efforts to his struggle to try to blow the whistle on this case, which was very hard for him. And, um, and But we describe it in, in great t- detail in the book. Yeah, one of the, the other central figures in here, the nemesis of uh, Tom Grant, is this Sergeant uh, Cameron and yeah, his refusal. Yeah. Even when he, he's faced with some compelling evidence, he says, well, I haven't heard anything that's going to convince me. So tell us a little bit more about, I mean, this is really a guy that's adamant that case is closed. So tell us about Sergeant Cameron and Tom Grant. Well, Sergeant Cameron was known as Mr. Homicide in the Seattle Police Department. Now, I later learned, now, uh, one of the things we did in this book, just an aside, is we didn't use any anonymous sources, but we also spoke to uh, several Seattle police officers. And one of the Seattle police officers uh, I spoke to on the record was a guy named Cloyd Steiger. And um, Sergeant Cameron was known as Mr. Homicide, not because he was a great homicide investigator, but because he actually ran the department like it was his own kingdom. And um, Cameron was on the scene that day, and Cameron was the one who ordered the case closed uh, the day Kirk Cobain's body was discovered. Now, one of the reasons he probably did that one of it was uh, the attitude of Cameron and probably of others there was that they didn't like these Seattle musicians with their grunge dress and their lifestyle. Uh, a lot of people in the political establishment in Seattle and in, in the government establishment uh, didn't like this, this new side of Seattle. And um, they had no sympathy for the, um, um, for them. We even quote one of the uh, one of the uh, private investigator in in Seattle telling Tom Grant, "What do you care about all these people, Tom? They're just a bunch of junkies." That was kind of the attitude uh, that Cameron had. Now, Cameron, um, when Tom went to confront Cameron, Tom didn't know at the time that the body had just been cremated. Cameron certainly knew this, and he brought with Cameron. He brought Harvey Levin, who's um, a big celebrity uh, news figure in the United States now. And um, he confronted Cameron, uh, showing Cameron the suicide note and also showing him um, uh, the credit card records. Now, the credit card records for Kirk Cobain, Kirk Cobain's credit card had been used repeatedly uh, the, the last week of his life, right up until the day the body was discovered. Now, we believe Kirk Cobain was probably killed on the 3rd or the 4th, late in the evening, April 3rd, or early in the morning, Monday, April 4th. But someone who was trying to use Kurt Cobain's credit card all the way up to April 8th, someone tried to use his credit card twice the morning his body was discovered. Who had that credit card? Uh, Tom had all the, you know, the, the proof from the bank of all these attempted transactions, and he showed them to Sean Cameron and said, someone got this guy's credit card well before the body was discovered. And that's pretty serious proof of wrongdoing. And Cameron just um, looked at Tom and said, you know, nothing nothing you've shown me is proof of anything but suicide. And um, he just wouldn't hear it. You know, he wasn't going to have this private investigator from Beverly Hills come in here and tell him how to do his job. But what Cameron also did is afterwards, after Tom left the office that day, and this is in the police reports, he called Courtney Love and arranged for detectives to go to the house the following Monday. And then he started ordering some uh, more investigation of, of, the, of the death. Uh, 
even though the body was already cremated, even though the case was already closed, he did it really just for to cover his uh, cover his butt, not to actually investigate the crime. So, for example, the shotgun uh, was tested for fingerprints, uh, but not until 28 days after the body was discovered. Well, you know, no legible prints were found on the shotgun suggesting that it was wiped down. It's a very large shotgun with a uh, 46-inch uh, long shotgun. That's nearly four feet long, and uh, there should have been prints all over it, given that it was handled by three people for, before, uh, before Kurt Cobain's death. Kurt, his best friend Dylan Carlson, and, and the gun salesman, but no prints were found on that shotgun, and that suggested it had been wiped down. But it wasn't even tested for almost a month after the body was. So they did all, the suicide note wasn't analyzed until um, two weeks after the body was discovered. So a lot of these things Cameron started doing after, after, after the case was closed and after the body had been cremated. Now, uh, a few years later, um, uh, Cameron um, was actually fired for, well, forced to retire for doctoring a crime scene in an unrelated case. And we described this at length in the book. He actually took, uh, one of his detectives actually stole um, $11,500 from a crime scene. And Cameron, rather than arresting this detective, actually took him back to the crime scene and uh, allowed this uh, detective to return the money to the crime scene. And then, um, and then they went in to rediscover the evidence. And, and, and uh, so it, Basically, he was abetting a felony. So the question is, um, uh, since Cameron doctored this, in 1997, he had doctored this uh, crime scene uh, where a theft occurred by one of his own detectives, which is a very serious uh, crime. <clears throat> one has to wonder how many other uh, crime scenes he has manipulated. Now, there was a note, Kurt Cobain, um, backtracking a bit here, we believe the first attempt on Kurt Cobain's life was in Rome, Italy, uh, um, you know, about a, a month before his own death, his actual death. Now, in Rome, Kurt Cobain had, he was on tour with Nirvana, and in Rome, um, he had told Courtney Love that he wanted, uh, he wanted a divorce, and he was adamant about it. Now, uh, he, wrote, he handed her a three-page note that he wrote on the hotel stationery. And um, the next day, he was rushed to the um, hospital um, for having overdosed on a mixture of champagne and uh, rohypnol. Now, the rohypnol belonged to Courtney. Courtney uh, has long uh, had a prescription for rohypnol. Rohypnol is known as a date rate drug in the United States. Uh, it's a sort of white dime-sized pill that can dissolve in liquid very quickly, and uh, it's odorless and tasteless, and it induces unconsciousness uh, right away. And um, when taken in combination with alcohol, it's deadly. Now, uh, Kurt Cobain didn't drink that much, but we believe that this Rome overdose was the first, in fact, the first attempt uh, on his life, and we describe this in the book. And um, <clears throat> when... Um, when he finally, but Kurt Cobain did not die. He was in a coma for 20 hours, and then he came back, to, and then he recovered and flew back to the United States. Um, but he still intended to divorce Courtney and, um, and still intended to leave Nirvana. Now, when Courtney came back to, uh, after his uh, death, Courtney used this note that Kurt gave her in Rome um, as a comparison writing sample gave that to the Seattle Police Department so they could compare it to the suicide note found at the crime scene in Seattle. Now, what Cameron did was Sergeant Cameron took that crime scene in June of 1994. He took that Rome note out of the evidence locker. He drove to Courtney's house, and we have a recording of Courtney describing this incident in detail. He returned that note to Courtney and told her to destroy it immediately. This note will not do you or your family any good. So um, now we have a lead suicide detective you know, returning the note to Courtney, um, well, certainly because he believes it's evidence that Kirk Cobain did not commit suicide, and telling her to destroy evidence. So this guy did a lot of this 
sort of thing. And um, the police chief at the time, Norm Stamper, you know, had a very low opinion of, uh, told us he had a very low opinion of, um, of uh, Cameron, and he tried to fire him, uh, but he just retired uh, very quickly after the scandal happened with his detective and uh, and died a few years later. So whatever, you know, he knew about the death of Kurt Cobain, he took to his... But at least we know for a fact that Tom originally alleged that the, that the detective uh, in charge of the Cobain case was a corrupt cop, and that has been proven to be true. Um, you know, he resigned. He was forced to resign in disgrace. Um, you know, and, and one dirty cop can do a lot of damage. Lend a lot of credence to what you were saying about uh, Courtney Love and the what you call the attempt, the first attempt at uh, Kurt Cobain, is that the conversation or this occurred around two or three a.m. and yet the ambulance got there at six thirty. Yeah. It, well, one thing you know, one thing about Courtney Love is that her um, here's a good uh, difference between Tom and Courtney. Uh, Tom's story has never changed. Tom is always told, as an investigator, he's always told the same story. His version of events has never once changed, and he's always been able to back up his version of events. Courtney has changed her story. You know, that's how innocent people uh, testify. Um, their story doesn't really change very much. Guilty people, you know, they um, uh, they change their story. Their story changes a little bit over time. And... Um, Courtney has changed her story in Rome uh, a few times. Now, according to Courtney, she told Spin and, Ro- and Rolling Stone magazine she got up at about between 3 and 4 in the morning, found Kurt, you know, in one version, Kurt's lying on the edge of the bed with blood coming out of his nostril, and another version, he's lying on the floor. But she found him at about 3 in the morning, <clears throat> according to her, and he was, um, you know, uh, with a with a suicide note and um, you know in a coma, but unfortunately for Courtney, you know the, the ambulance didn't arrive till 6:30. Uh, and so why was about a three-hour delay in calling the ambulance? So why the three-hour delay and what what happened during that three-hour delay? And this goes back to the problem uh, to the uh, question of media manipulation. And this I think is the most interesting part of the book. Um, David Geffen, probably the biggest figure in the in the, in the corporate music uh, industry, uh, the head of Geffen Records, claims that Courtney Love um, called him from Rome and told him that Kurt Cobain had finally committed suicide. Uh, his exact words were, "Well, if, if you know, if someone's determined to commit suicide, you know, there's nothing you can do." That's what he told. Uh, Nirvana's manager, Danny Goldberg. Danny Goldberg claims that uh, later claimed that Courtney Love did not actually call David Geffen, that it was actually a prank phone call, that someone pretending to be Courtney called David Geffen at his office and, and told him that. Just a very suspicious uh, alibi there. David Geffen is not an easy guy to get on the telephone. I mean, I, I don't think I could pick up my phone tomorrow and get David Geffen on the phone. No. Think I could do it, <laughs> but but um, and and at this time, of course, at the time this phone call came to David Geffen, almost no one knew that Kurt Cobain, uh, you know, had had fallen into a coma room. There, there was no online media at this time. It wasn't. There was no uh, nothing was posted online. It was very few people were in the know. And David Geffen got this claims he got this phone call from Courtney Love telling him. The talking point that she, the very talking point that she has always insisted on, Kurt Cobain was congenital, congenitally suicidal, and he finally took his own life. That's what. But apparently, you know, the official, their, their official alibi is no, it was a hoax, it was an imposter, it was a prank phone call, but we can never figure out who did it. And it's just really, really, that's a quite a stretch. But uh, at any rate. Um, Kurt Cobain did not die in Rome, and uh, when she, he came back to Seattle, he had not, you know, he had not changed his mind. He was still going to divorce Courtney. It wasn't, of course, it's not easy to get a divorce when, you, when two people have a child together. It's not like you can just, you know, walk out the door. But uh, there was a child, and they did, you know, have to figure out 
uh, what to uh, what to do about it and how to handle it. So it's not you know an easy break to make, but he was certainly determined to make the break. Now, he, when he came back to Seattle, he called his uh, um, Courtney was afraid that he was going to leave. And if he had left Seattle and divorced her, um, she was going to be in trouble. She could not let Kurt Cobain leave Seattle because he was going to leave with all of his money and her career would fall apart. So um, one thing that she did was when he left for a few days, she was afraid that he was going to be gone for good. So she canceled all of his credit cards and you know his ATM card. He was in a motel in Seattle. And when she did this, he called Rosemary Carroll, his attorney in Los Angeles, and told her that he wanted uh, Rosemary to draft him a new will and he wanted Courtney cut out of it. And when he returned to the house, he told Courtney about, about what he had done. And Courtney flew into a rage. She was not going to be in Kurt's will. It, it really drove her over the edge. And right after that, there was uh, what I call the March 18th incident. And this is one of my... Um, personally, one of my favorite sections of the book. Now, what we, again, what we did in the book was we contacted a lot of, uh, several people from the Seattle Police Department and spoke to them on the record. <clears throat> now, on March 18th, Courtney Love dialed 911, and this was widely reported in the press after Kirk Cobain's death, and told uh, the 911 operator that Kirk Cobain had locked himself in a room and uh, had a gun and had threatened to kill himself. Now, when people stage a um, a murder to look like a suicide, they often plant a suicide trail both before and after the murder. <laughs> Here, she, she plants this story that Kirk Cobain uh, had locked himself in a room and he was going to commit suicide. So the, arresting off- the arriving officer named uh, Officer Ed- Everett Edwards, and I spoke to him personally, and he gets to the scene and Courtney is standing, you know, on her front, on the front of the house, and she's screaming wildly at them. And she says, uh, "You know, he's got a gun. He's going to kill himself." And she's, and he said, "Okay, well, we can't enter the house until you know other units arrive." And she screams at him. She says, "Well, if you're not going to do anything, just get the f out of here." She screams at him, and then, but other units arrived within minutes, and um, so some people go through, some officers go through the front door. Officer Edwards and his partner, they go and run around to the back door. And when they get to the back door, they spot Kirk Cobain. And he doesn't have a gun. He's not locked inside his room. He's standing in the backyard with his hands in his pockets, rolling his eyes, deeply embarrassed, and, oh, my God, there goes Courtney Love. There goes Courtney dialing the cops again. So Edwards approach, Officer Edwards approaches to the police car. They sit in the back of the car. Kirk, Kurt says, you know, we just had a big fight. I locked myself in a room in a while to get away from her. I didn't have a gun, and I never said I was going to hurt myself. Now, this is in the police report. When officers interviewed Courtney, she actually admitted to them that she made the entire story up. She never saw him with a gun and never heard him say anything of the kind. Now, this is actually something that's new in the book. In after Kurt Co- Cobain's death, the press reported on this incident as evidence of Kurt uh, being suicidal and uh, Courtney Love desperately trying to save his life. They Courtney's version of the incident, not the Seattle Police Department's version or Officer Edwards' version. This is this is something that's new that's never been uh, reported before in the book. So. Courtney Love's version that he attempted suicide on March 18th was actually featured in a cover story. It was reported the, uh, the day after Kurt's body was discovered and uh, widely reported in the press and even in a cover story in Newsweek. Uh, there was Newsweek, this cover story called The Mystery of Suicide, and it described this March 18th incident as a suicide attempt and also an effect successful attempt by Courtney to save her cousin's life. Completely false. We talked to the officer on the scene and he debunks the entire uh, the entire tale that she's told. But again, Courtney is very good at manipulating the press. and She did it then. And um, uh, she got her story uh, out there first and, and that's what everyone believed. But it's not true. 
Now we only got uh, a few minutes left, and I know okay. we this book is uh, exhaustive in terms of the investigation that that Tom Grant did to cover every single solitary base. And like you say, you were interviewed uh, numerous people yourself. Um, just quickly, there the thing that probably people haven't heard at all is at near the end of your book when you talk about actually some police officers coming forward and disagreeing with the official Seattle Police Department's assessment of it, and, and namely an Officer Wilson and, hopefully I don't mispronounce this, Detective Sieninski. So tell us a little bit, just a little bit about that, just as a little tease for people to realize that uh, if they go to the book, they're going to be reading this kind of further evidence, stuff that they've never heard before, to refute the official claim of suicide. Well, um, uh, a couple of years ago, right before the 20th anniversary of Kurt Cobain's death, uh, Seattle Police Department um, claimed to have reopened the, uh, the case file and was going to re-examine the evidence. Now, they assigned this to a man named Detective Mike Szynski. Susin- uh, Szynski actually was one of uh, a detective that worked closely and directly under Detective Cameron. Um, he's, he's been on the force for a long time. He was a very poor choice uh, to, to work on this case. It, it, the media, the Seattle police sort of pretended that, you know, they were going to look at the evidence again with a fresh set of eyes, but Detective Kaczynski was nothing of the kind. And all he really did was he... Uh, he opened up the case file and he developed some film that hadn't been developed yet. And then he, he just reiterated the official story that Kurt Cobain had, had committed suicide. The thing about this is he got on, he got on television and um, he uh, actually admitted that, that the, the, the city of Seattle had never seen a level of heroin in, um, uh, in, in, in someone's, uh, in a deceased body as high as Kirk Cobain's. Uh, they, they had never seen it in, in their lives. And he made several uh, statements that, that um, like that, that, that undermined uh, the case for homicide. It was a very bizarre interview. Uh, he really, you know, shot himself in the foot, in, in the department in the foot, for that matter. And then he um, did a written report follow-up, and he tried to explain why the shotgun shell was found uh, on the opposite side of the body where it should have been found. And he claimed he came up with this theory that the, the shotgun uh, pivoted or rotated after being fired. So, uh, you know, it would sort of flip over and, and uh, eject a shotgun shell and then flip back up like a, a 180 degrees. It's, it didn't make any sense. Um, so the um, I didn't understand what how the shotgun could pivot. I've fired shotguns before, and they do not pivot when they're being fired and, uh, or rotate. And um, so I called the police officer who gave this analysis, Officer Wilson, um, myself, and Officer Kurt Wilson, and I said, you know, you gave this, uh, you performed this analysis of the shotgun for Dr. Zinsky. Can you tell me exactly what you meant by this? And he said, oh, you know, actually, I, I, I didn't mean that the shotgun pivoted. I just meant, uh, you know, the shotgun was probably just injected into, directly into his mouth, and then um, the force of gravity would have had it rotate 180 degrees after it fired. And he, but he told me, he admitted to me, I just looked at a couple of photographs, and I just, you know, that was pure speculation on my part. So that was pretty much the extent of... Uh, the ballistics they did, the re-examination of the evidence. It was a very cursory, quick re-examination of the evidence, uh, and the Seattle Police admitted, fully admitted that to me. So, um, you know, it's, it's, they're, they're trying to make it look like they uh, you know, went over it with a fine-tooth comb, but um, not at all. So this is a, a case that is... Uh, still haunting them. Uh, we have made a little headway with the Seattle Police Department uh, lately. I can't get too much into that. Uh, we have had a few po- more positive signs uh, from them 
recently uh, some members of the Seattle Police Department. So I'm optimistic about that. I think they know that this um, this story is not going to go away. So I'm actually, more recently, I'm actually uh, encouraged what I, by what I hear from the Seattle Police Department. Well, that's very encouraging and very interesting to hear, and I'm sure that there will be more to this story. It sure, certainly seems like it, and uh, I applaud the effort from you and Tom to get this story out because this is something that uh, – it's a very, very compelling argument. You provide all of the – again, like I say, it's not a tenuous um, connection between all of these things. You provide all of the information, and it's very interesting and exciting story to see all the major figures in this, like you say, David Geffen and Harvey uh, – Eleven, and so it's just it's just chock full of all the kinds of people that you read about, and then this this crazy connection that they have with Courtney Love. I want to thank you very much for coming on and talking about the mysterious uh, death of Kurt Cobain, uh, suicide or murder. If people are more interested, is there a Facebook page and a website? Uh, tell us a little bit about how people might look into this further. Well, uh, you can find the book on Amazon Kindle uh, and uh, the. The uh, website, CobainCase.com, um, is uh, a good place to go if you want to see some of the evidence and hear some of the actual um, audio recordings that Tom Grant made with Courtney Love, so you can judge for the evidence for yourself. Um, and uh, I think when people do that, I, I've never known anyone who, who uh, didn't hear the recordings for themselves who who didn't uh who didn't come away convinced. So I encourage people to do so. Absolutely. Well I want to thank you very much for for coming on and talking about this very fine book, The Mysterious Death of Kurt Cobain. Thank you very much, Matthew. You have a great evening. Good night. You too. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Good night. Good night.